My name is David Watson, and I'm the Academic Dean and Associate Professor of New Testament at United Theological Seminary. Christians have always wrestled with difficult passages of the Bible, uh, passages about slavery, passages about war, uh, money, uh, sex, different kinds of issues. And over the centuries, we've developed a variety of interpretive strategies in order to deal with these kinds of passages. For example, sometimes we've said, you know, we need to interpret this passage as metaphor, or we need to interpret this passage as allegory. Or at times we've said, well, we know what the Bible says here, but the Bible says something else here, and we think that this is the proper interpretation that the Bible gives us on this particular issue. And so over the years, these interpretive strategies have really helped us to deal with these difficult passages of Scripture. Well, one set of interpretive strategies has come to us recently from Reverend Adam Hamilton in his book, Making Sense of the Bible. And Adam Hamilton says that we can divide Scripture really up into three basic categories. The metaphor that he uses for this is buckets. And so he says, you know, the first category is passages that reflect the timeless will of God. He says most passages of the Bible actually go into this category. But there's a second category, passages that may have reflected the will of God at one time, but do so no longer. And then there's a third category, and that is passages that never reflected the will of God. Now this is a pretty radical departure from the church's positions historically on the nature and function of Scripture. Because while the church has been content and even found it necessary to employ a variety of interpretive strategies and to face these difficult passages of Scripture head on, we've never, we've, we've never embraced attempts to essentially decanonize parts of the Bible or to suggest that parts of the Bible are uniquely inspired but other parts of the Bible are not. And so while I really admire Adam Hamilton, I think a lot of him, I don't agree with him on this particular issue. A touchstone for the church on this matter has always been 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. Not some scripture, all scripture is God breathed. Well. What do we do then with passages where we say one, one part of Scripture may not be consistent with another part of Scripture? Or passages like those dealing with slavery that may express perspectives that we don't think are consistent with the Christian life? What do we do with those passages? That's actually a really complex question. One thing we can say is that while we believe that all Scripture is God-breathed, while we believe that all scripture has been given to us by God to teach us something. At the same time, not all of scripture is prescriptive. We don't have to adopt every theological or ethical position that we come across in the Bible. And there are some passages in the Bible that we give more weight to than other passages in the Bible. So for example, in Mark 7, when Jesus declares all foods clean, we give that weight over above Old Testament dietary restrictions. Or for Protestants, for example, the teachings of Paul form a really central place in our theology. So we believe, for example, that the book of Jude is indeed an inspired work of Scripture, but we simply, if we're honest, we don't give it the same weight that we give to Paul's teaching on salvation in Romans 5 through 8. These just don't occupy the same space for us. All Scripture is inspired, but not all of Scripture is necessarily prescriptive. So let me say this one more time. While we don't have to adopt every perspective that we come across in Scripture, and we don't give equal weight to every passage of Scripture, we believe as Christians that God can use any passage of Scripture to teach us, and in fact that God has given us the whole canon of Scripture for this very reason. So in light of the wide variety of perspectives that we come across in Scripture, how do we make decisions about the Christian life using Scripture? 
This is another really complex issue, but I think the key to it is that we make these decisions in community. We consult with our community of faith as we're interpreting scripture for the Christian life. The Bible isn't just my book or your book. The Bible is the church's book. We gather together, we pray with one another, we consult each other, we listen to each other. Sometimes we even argue with one another. But at the end of the day, we make decisions and we hold one another accountable. And the community with which we consult isn't just my church on Sunday morning or my Bible study on Wednesday evening or even the United Methodist Church. My community is the communion of saints, the people who have gone before me in the faith, the fathers and mothers of the church, the saints and martyrs who have so given of themselves so that you and I can come to know Jesus Christ and the life that he gives us. That's our community. And we live into a vision of life that's formed by the Bible and shaped by the historic community of believers. And we acknowledge that we don't always get it right. Not just as individuals, but also as a community. We're going on into Christian maturity. We're growing as a community in our knowledge and love of God. So in this spirit of communal biblical interpretation, I want to emphasize again my great respect for my brother in Christ, Adam Hamilton. But on this one issue, I find myself in disagreement with him because I really want to hold on to this notion of all Scripture as inspired by God and in one way or another as useful for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness.